Good evening. Go ahead and open your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we'll start there this evening. And uh, it's a real joy to be in this uh, new auditorium together. And um, it still feels a little uh, surreal after months of waiting and a lot of work. So it's just a real pleasure to be able to have such a wonderful space to gather and worship together. Um, we are uh, continuing our series. We're called Baptist Beliefs. And uh, we're talking about the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, which is our church's doctrinal statement of faith. It's the same doctrinal statement of faith that is shared by all churches in cooperation with the Southern Baptist Convention. And it's been in use for uh, almost 100 years. The current version is the 2000 version. That's what we're looking at. And we are on Article 9. Hopefully on the way in there, you got a copy of uh, the printout that we've been giving each week on the article. And I'm actually going to be doing the next four weeks. The next four weeks, this week's on the kingdom. Next week is on last things. And then after that is evangelism and missions. And then the fourth week is on education. Education. So that's what we're going to be covering the next couple weeks together. I'm going to go ahead and just start off by reading the article that we're covering today. And, and then I'll uh, read this verse from Mark, Mark 1. We're going to look at Mark 1, 14 and 15. And then we'll ask the Lord's help in prayer. So this is what Article 9 says. The kingdom. The kingdom of God includes both his general sovereignty over the universe and his particular kingship over men who willfully acknowledge him as king. Particularly, the kingdom is the realm of salvation into which men enter by trustful, childlike commitment to Jesus Christ. Christians ought to pray and to labor that the kingdom may come and God's will be done on earth. The full consummation of the kingdom awaits the return of Jesus Christ and the end of the age. And then Mark 1, 14 and 15 says this. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's pray. And Father, I pray that uh, this night, as we look at your word, that we might be strengthened, we might be encouraged in our faith, we might have a greater confidence in the King that has come to rescue us, and a greater hope and a greater commitment to building his kingdom. I pray, God, that we would live, uh, we would leave here and more in love with King Jesus as a result of this time this evening. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the idea of a king and a kingdom is actually, you know, somewhat foreign to us as Americans. After all, we're the people that revolted against British rule, and we burned effigies of King George III in the streets, and we celebrate the birth of our nation, not when the first European settlers came to colonize this continent, but when we declared independence from foreign rule. So, uh, in general, we kind of have an aversion to kingship. But I was reminded recently about how different other countries think about the importance of kingship. T and I, we've been watching uh, the Netflix series, The Crown, which chronicles the rise of Queen Elizabeth II. And in one of the early scenes of the show, her grandmother, Queen Mary of Tech, gives this advice to the newly crowned Queen Elizabeth II. And this is what she says, and this belies their attitude towards kingship. She said, monarchy, is God's sacred mission to grace and dignify the earth, to give ordinary people an ideal to strive towards, an example of nobility and duty to raise them in their wretched lives. Monarchy is a calling from God. That is why you are crowned in an abbey, not in a government building. Why you are anointed, not appointed. It's an archbishop that puts the crown on your head and not a minister or a public servant which means that you are answerable to God in your duty, not to the public. Now, the sad reality, whether it's intentional or not, is that what the show demonstrates is that the royal family is anything but worthy of imitation. Nevertheless, there's still a great fascination by even people in our country to the royal family, maybe because we don't have one, but certainly even in their own country. So kingship is important. Different countries view it differently. But it's important for us too. It's important for us probably for different reasons than it is for those who uh, have a monarchy in their own country. 
But this is the topic of our teaching tonight on the kingdom. And at one level, you might say, well, isn't this a kind of a basic idea, basic concept? Well, sure, it is at one level. At another level, there's actually been a lot of confusion in the history of the church over what exactly is the kingdom of God and what is our duty towards that kingdom. The most obvious example of some of that confusion in church history is the Crusades during the Middle Ages. For many of those crusaders, they thought of the kingdom of God as something they had to take up arms to defend, and they had to go fight for and defend a specific piece of real estate. And for centuries, they battled against Islamic forces for control of the little strip of land in Palestine they called the Holy Land. And they did it all in the name of Jesus, fighting for his kingdom, for hoping to have a place in his kingdom after they die. Now, we look down as the Crusaders is kind of foolish, and it's a kind of a blight on church history. It's something we have to explain away when we get a question about it. We're trying to share the gospel, and all that is, for the most part, pretty accurate. But oftentimes, even us, who aren't tempted to go and pick up a sword and defend the Holy Land in the same way, even as a American citizens fighting the culture war against liberals and progressives, we can sometimes confuse the think that we're fighting for God's kingdom here in our country. So we need clarity over what exactly is God's kingdom and what exactly is our duty in that kingdom. So when we come to this topic, it raises a lot of questions. A lot of questions such as, what exactly is the kingdom? Is it a specific piece of real estate that God has special authority over? Is it the church? Is it here now, or is it something we're still looking forward to and something we're waiting to arrive, something in the future? Who exactly is in the kingdom of God? Doesn't God's kingdom extend over everyone, regardless of whether or not you believe in Jesus? And are we all in the kingdom? Can't we all, at this one level, help establish his kingdom, regardless of whether or not we're Christians or not? Don't we have to work for it? Those are a lot of questions. And this brief statement in the Baptist Fifth and Message 2000 helps answer some of these questions. But to frame our time tonight, I want to um, summarize this paragraph and the Bible's teaching as a whole in the kingdom with uh, a simple definition that I want to unpack in three steps. So if you're taking notes, this is, this is uh, some hooks to anchor our time together on tonight. Here's a very simple definition I want to offer, and I want to walk through this. The kingdom, the kingdom is the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. Let me say one more time. The kingdom is the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. And there's three parts to that definition, and all of them are important. You need all three of them to have a kingdom, because a king with no power is just someone who wishes to be someone else. Uh, if you don't have any power, you don't have any authority, you're no, there's no functional kingship. It's just titular, but it's not actually functional. And a king needs subjects. You can say you're a king, but if you have no one to rule, you know, it's funny, I was, I was browsing around the internet, something got, this is always dangerous when you're doing that, but I found this thing on the internet, they were advertising, I could like sign up to be a, a lord of some like plot of land in Scotland or something like that. And I was like, oh, and like basically it's the equivalent of like 12 inches of land you can own and you can actually get like a real title and be part of the nobility. It sounds kind of cool, you just put up on the wall and you tell people you're Sir Richard Lucas or something like that, I guess, or Duke of this 12 inches and you gotta maintain it. Well, <laughs> so I can say all I want, but I don't actually have any people to rule, okay? So a king's gotta have people, uh, he's gotta have subjects to rule. And lastly, a king has to have a realm. He's gotta have some place to rule these people, some place that they live. So you need all three of those, power, people, and place. So all three are important, the king's power over the king's people and the king's place. So I just wanna walk through each of those three things. So first, the king's power, the king's power, this is his rule. So, and this really comes out in the first half of the first sentence of our definition here. It says the kingdom of God includes his general sovereignty over the universe. The kingdom of God includes his general sovereignty over the universe. So the king's power consists of three things. His rule consists of three things. First of all, it starts in creation and it includes all of creation. His kingdom starts in creation and it includes all of creation. God is the sovereign. 
He is the king. He is the ruler. And therefore, because he is the sovereign, he has sovereignty over all that he's made, which is, incidentally, everything. He is the ruler of everything because he made everything. So he is the king. He has sovereignty over all things. Because God created everything, he owns everything. And he rules over it. And we understand this. It kind of makes sense. Uh, maybe you know this as an experience in your home. So my, my oldest son now, he, um, he thinks he's taller than me. I'm not sure if he's quite taller than me, but he's been taller than my wife for a little while now. And sometimes, as teenage boys can be wont to do, he can get a little too big for his britches. And I'm not home, and he's getting on his mom's nerves. And my wife will say, okay, just remember, I made you. <laughs> I made you. And what she's trying to say is, I own you. <laughs> I'm in charge of you. I rule you because I made you. You listen to me. And in the same way, God made the whole universe. And so he owns the whole universe, and he's the king over the whole universe. Longtime Dallas Seminary professor Eugene Merrill says it like this, the kingdom story begins with the very first sentence in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. By this simple but majestic affirmation, both king and realm are introduced. And in the six days that follow, the citizens of the kingdom, inanimate, inanimate, appear in their course until mankind, the crowning glory of the creator, takes center stage. The stage has been set, the players are ready, and the drama may now begin. So God's kingdom, his rule, his power first, starts in creation, includes all of creation. And second of all, it actually also includes all the Bible. So God's power, his kingship is all throughout the Bible, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. So here's just a few references for you. In the very beginning, in the law of Moses, in Exodus 15, 18, it says, the Lord will reign forever and ever. Moving forward in the Bible to the book of Psalms. Psalm 24.10 says, he is the king of glory. Going to the prophets in Isaiah 6.1, the beatific vision of God describes him in chapter 6, verse 1 of Isaiah as exalted and high and sitting on a throne because he's king. Moving forward to the gospels, Jesus himself says the great commission, Matthew 28.18, all authority has been given, on heaven and earth has been given to me, all authority, all power. All rulership has been given to me. Even in the gospel, in the epistles, in 1 Timothy 1, 17, says, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be, only, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He's the eternal king. And in the book of Revelation, the end of the Bible, chapter 19, verse 6, says, then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude like the sound of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. He reigns. He reigns because he's the king. It's his power. The king's power is the first part of the kingdom. So the king's power starts in creation and includes all of creation. The king's power is all throughout the Bible. And the king's power, lastly, it knows no limits. It knows no limits. There's nothing outside of his sovereign reign. There's nothing that he's not control over. Look at Daniel chapter 4. Turn to Daniel chapter 4. This is after Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king at this time in the ancient world, was humbled after a period of seven years of madness. He proclaims in Daniel chapter 4 verse 34, But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. And here's what he said, speaking of God, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will and the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? God does not have to give an account to anybody. God doesn't have to check first. God doesn't have to give, give a report. God doesn't have to ask permission. God doesn't have to even explain to us why he does what he does because he's sovereign, because he's the king because he rules us, because he made us. 
And there's no escaping his sovereignty, whether it's the host of heaven or all the inhabitants of the earth. Everybody falls under his rule. And he's sovereign over all. And he can do whatever he wants because there's no limit to his power because he made us. He doesn't need our permission to act. He doesn't need to check with us first. He doesn't need to make sure it's okay according to what we think. God is sovereign because he has sovereignty over all because he made all. So the king's power starts with creation, runs all through creation. The king's power is all throughout the Bible and the king's power has no limits because he's the king. That's the first part of the definition. The kingdom of God is the king's power, secondly, over the king's people. Over the king's people. These are the residents, the subjects of God's kingdom. And as our definition says, going back to this again, it's general to all people, but then there's an exclusiveness to a particular people. So the first sentence in the definition goes on. The kingdom of God includes both his general sovereignty over the universe and his particular kingship over men who willfully acknowledge him as king. Particularly, the kingdom is the realm of salvation into which men enter by trustful, childlike commitment to Jesus Christ. So what this tells us is that there is a particularness, there is an exclusiveness to the kingdom of God. Not everybody in this saving sense is part of God's kingdom in the saving realm of his kingdom. We know this from passages like 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous are excluded from God's kingdom. They're not part of his kingdom, not in this sense. Well then, if some are not part of his kingdom and the unrighteous are not part of his kingdom, well, how does someone get to be part of his kingdom? Well, turn with me to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14 say, For he rescued us, he delivered us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. To, To be part of the king's people, we need to be rescued from another kingdom. We need to be transferred from one kingdom, the domain of darkness, to the kingdom of his son. Hebrews chapter 2 says that, therefore, this is verses 14 and 15, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. We were subjects to slavery, and our master was the devil, and the threat was death, and it had dominion over us, and we were dead in our sins, and we were part of that kingdom. Until God, in his loving kindness, rescued us and transferred us. And the way he did that is by redeeming us. Redeeming is the language of buying, of purchasing. He purchased us from the slave market. We were subjects to slavery and sin, and he bought us and paid for us, and he did that with his own blood by the death penalty that he didn't deserve. He paid for our sin, and therefore was able to offer forgiveness because our sins have been paid for, and he offers us to be transferred to a new kingdom, the kingdom of his beloved son. Even in the title, it's the loving son that he gives us entry into. That's the place we get to join him in this beloved son's kingdom because he bought us and transferred us, redeemed us, and therefore has forgiven us of our sins. That's what Christ offers. That's what he offers to everyone. And if there's any here right now that are listening who have never experienced that, who don't know about the freedom and the forgiveness and the kingdom transference that Jesus offers, I want to tell you right now that you don't have to stay a subject of sin. You don't have to stay underneath your master, the devil. You don't have to stay in the domain of darkness. You can be transferred. You can be redeemed. You can be forgiven and bought. And Jesus offers that to anyone who, as our confession says, would demonstrate trustful, childlike commitment in Jesus. You have to humble yourself. You have to accept this king. You have to give up the attempt to live your life the way you want to live it. 
and you have to surrender to a king. And you surrender to this king. He promises to give you all the privileges of kingship and share them with you. But you have to trust in him. And you can be received into his kingdom. That's the wonderful news about being in the play, in the, being a member of the people of the kingdom of God. And the irony is that this king, when he came to establish his kingdom, he didn't come wielding power. He said, power is found in weakness. He said, life is found through death. And he said, victory is achieved through defeat. It's the exact opposite of everything we would expect from human rulers and human kingdoms in this world. He turned the whole equation upside down. That's why this kingdom is established through the cross. Because that's how his power is shown. That's where his victory is shown. That's where his strength is shown. And that's where we can join him by receiving the forgiveness offered on the cross. So the kingdom is the king's power over the king's people. And lastly, it's the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. In the king's place. The the place or the realm of the kingdom is actually where a lot of people get tripped up. They get tripped up in trying to understand how this works out. And let me try to help you. Very simply, to put it simply, God's kingdom started with all of creation and it's going to end with all of creation. God's not going to concede any ground to a foreign ruler or a foreign power. It all started out as his, and he's going to bring it all back under his rule. In creation, he established his rule in perfect harmony with all creation, including Adam, who he set up as a bit of a vice regent, an under king, to, to mediate his rule and his, and, his, and his kingship throughout all creation, starting at the Garden of Eden. But when Adam sinned, he plunged the whole earth under sin, and the curse fell. And starting then, God needed a new plan, a plan that he planned from before the foundation of the world because the lamb was slain. Nevertheless, it was a saving plan. The kingdom of God was going to come by redemption. It was going to finish with all creation, but it was going to start incrementally. And progressively through the Bible, each step through the Bible is another step of enacting his saving kingdom plan. Each one of the main leaders in the Old Testament is an example of this, bringing God's salvation rule to everyone. Starting with Adam and then with Noah. Noah was the new Adam who was supposed to create a new world after the flood. And what did he do? Well, as soon as he got done doing that, he messed up in Genesis chapter 9. And he failed. And then God picked a man named Abraham, plucked him out of idolatry and said, I'm going to start using you to create a new nation. I'm going to use you to bless all the nations of the earth. It was always meant to be a whole earth project. And using him eventually led to the people of Israel. And he brought Moses, and even using Moses to create a covenant people in the nation of Israel. He said in in, uh, Exodus 19.6, I intend for you to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Meaning they were supposed to be a mediation of God's rule through the whole earth. They weren't just supposed to keep God's law to themselves. They weren't supposed to just keep God's kingship to himself. They're supposed to spread it to all the nations. But they too failed. Eventually, to the people's sin, they said they wanted a king. Like the nations, God allowed them to have, eventually have the right king in King David. And he made a covenant promise with him in 2 Samuel 7 that one of his descendants would reign forever and ever. But David himself he failed as well. He wasn't even allowed to even build the temple because he was a man of war, because of the blood stain on his hands. It wasn't finally until the right ruler, the last Adam, came and undid all the sin and rebellion that everyone before him fell into by proving perfect righteousness and establishing his own kingdom, the kingdom of God, given to the beloved son. And when Jesus comes, when the king arrives, The kingdom is here too. That's how you know when the kingdom comes, because the king is here. When Jesus comes, he offers that kingdom. But right now, you might say, well, where is that kingdom? This is what perplexed the disciples, perplexed them to no end. When are we going to start this kingdom plan? How's this going to go? They understood it. They misunderstood it. They wanted his disciples to rise up and cross the oppressive Romans, but instead he did the exact opposite. He hung out with societal rejects. He never lifted a sword. 
He never gathered an army, and he allowed himself to be brutally and humiliatingly executed by the Romans. But that wasn't defeat. That was the means, the path to victory through the cross. The same path he brings all of us through. If you trust in him. God's kingdom was always meant to be so much bigger than just the land of Israel. That's what the crusaders didn't understand. That's what the early pilgrims didn't understand when they came to America and they wanted to establish a city on the hill, undiluted (laughs) from sin. They messed that up real fast. They're always trying to restart this kingdom plan. But all along, the Old Testament is so clear. Think of a passage like Habakkuk 2.4. 2.14 says, For the earth we filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The whole earth we followed and we filled with the knowledge of God. The whole earth. That's why in Romans chapter 4, says the promise to Abraham and his seed is that they would inherit the whole earth. That's why in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, he says, the meek will inherit the earth. And that's why finally and fully, when his plan of kingdom redemption is finally consummated, it will include the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. So even though God's kingdom has started now, it has not been consummated. That's the last line of our statement here. It says the full consummation of the kingdom awaits for the turn of Jesus Christ and the end of the age. We shouldn't be looking for the final consummation of his kingdom now. It's not time yet. It has begun, but it's not finished yet. It will come fully and finally when Jesus returns in power. And then he'll suppress all enemies. And he'll claim the whole creation for himself again and bring us to be joint heirs with him. In the meantime, you say, where is the kingdom? Where can I see it? Well, the kingdom is a lot bigger than the church, But right now, the church is where you go to see the kingdom. This is where God's people are, living under God's reign, trying to administer God's rule, and living according to his kingdom ethic. It's in the church. And that's why our project that we're commissioned to do is to build his church, to bring other people into it, out of the domain of darkness, into the kingdom of the beloved son, by trusting in Jesus and joining into his church. Because one day that church will expand and include the whole earth when Jesus returns. That's the final consummation. And we're excited for that. Well, in conclusion, I want to leave you with three closing applications. Three closing applications. As we think about the kingdom, as we think about our responsibility now, you think about these big global concepts, and a lot of these verses seem big and cosmic and abstract, maybe from us, there's a responsibility that we have as well right now. First of all, as we think about the fact that Jesus is the king, we need to think about the fact that we need to bend the knee completely to King Jesus. Bend the knee completely to King Jesus. If you've ex- been transferred into his kingdom, you've already acknowledged him as king, but maybe subtly in your heart there's some areas you're holding out and you've not submitted to him fully yet. Sins that are still dominating you that you need to repent of. You need to trust him with you need, to, you need to turn from. Maybe it's in your money. You, just, you know actually God wants you to give you more. But you're like, I, I give enough. God doesn't get all of it. Well, is he the king or is he not? Bend the knee to him. Maybe it's in your time. You know, listen, I, I work a lot. Sure, I go to church, but now they want me to serve. I got to like, do this nursery rotation and they need other people to help and bring meals to people and stuff like that. Like, oh gosh, that just takes a lot of time. Well, Is it your time or is it the king's time? Are you his subject or are you your own subject? It's his rule. Bend the knee completely. Or maybe it's in your speech. You grumble and you complain a lot. (laughs) Maybe you use some foul language sometimes and words that you shouldn't say slip out. And you're like, well, that's just kind of a holdover from before. Well, is Jesus king completely or not? Have you surrendered his kingship completely or not? Maybe it's in your temper. You get angry and you raise your voice sometimes. And you know you shouldn't do that. And you're like, well, I just, other people make me so mad. That's another area. Remember, you need to surrender to King Jesus. Maybe it's even in your doctrine, your theology. And you hear statements like God is sovereign, like our confession says. You're like, I just don't like that. I don't like him telling me what to do. I want to be in charge of some things. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's about surrendering completely to him. So, 
Is there any area where you need to completely bend the knee to King Jesus now as part of his kingdom subjects? Secondly, I want to encourage you to announce the arrival of King Jesus. Announce his arrival. There's this beautiful picture in the book of Isaiah. It talks about a watchman who waits in the wall, and he's looking for a messenger to come. This messenger is a herald who runs ahead of the king, and he comes to announce the king's arrival. And the book of Isaiah says, and then Paul says this in Romans chapter 10, he says, this person who brings this good news, this gospel news, has beautiful feet. Beautiful feet. That's ironic because these heralds oftentimes, because they're dirty grounds and they're running for a long time, their feet would be bruised or even cracked and dried up with blood. They might even be... um, Uh, worn out of sandals and all that. And yet, despite that, he says they had beautiful feet. Beautiful feet because they announced the arrival of the king. So I want to ask all of you to have beautiful feet to announce the arrival of the king. And just to give something really practical as a way to do that, well, in a week and a half, we have Easter. So we've printed these uh, Easter invite cards we got a bunch of them out here in the foyer. You can grab one of these on the way out. You know, I've been trying to grab these as I'm going to lunch with somebody or just out and about, and I throw a couple in my pocket. And I've just been really surprised by how receptive people are. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll just stop. I'll walk up to the couple of the waitresses at the host table. Hey, I just want to invite you to Easter. Like, oh, yeah, uh, you've got a church service. Do you have, oh, yeah, it's great. People are, like, excited to receive it. And you know what? They would, never, they would never take it if I didn't offer it. It's so easy. People are thinking about church on Sunday for Easter. And so grab a couple invites and announce the king's arrival. Have the beautiful feet that announces the king's arrival. You can do that. And lastly, I just want to close with this. I want to encourage you to patiently wait for and work for the kingdom that will last until King Jesus returns. What I have in mind here is the statement that we didn't read yet, the last statement in here. It says, Christians ought to pray and to labor that the kingdom may come and God's will be done on earth. There's a lot of things that could occupy our time. There's a lot of things that we can get frustrated about and a lot of things that we could spend time on in this life. And what we're being called to do is to work for the kingdom that will last, not for the kingdom that won't last. And so be patient right now as you're in a kingdom an earthly kingdom, that's not all it's supposed to be because it's still being taken over and conquered. We're living in between the ages where the kingdom of God has been initiated, it's begun, but it's not yet been consummated. It's not been finally realized. And so don't get confused and spending all your time and energy working for the wrong kingdom. Be patient knowing that all the evils of this world all the injustices, all the things that aren't fair, all the evils that, play, that uh, plague our society won't be undone until Jesus returns. So as we are frustrated and have angst and want to work and put effort in, put it in the right kingdom, the kingdom that will last, the kingdom that God is building, the kingdom that will be fully consummated when Jesus returns. There's been a lot of kingdoms that come and go throughout human history. And I want to just conclude where uh, Pastor Scott began us in Hebrews chapter 12. Let's just look at that verse. This is the last one we'll look at here. Hebrews 12, 26 to 29, it says, And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So what he's saying is, when once more, when his voice speaks, anything that's been created that can be shaken is going to be shaken. But the thing that won't be shaken is going to remain. And then he says this, well, what is that thing? Verse 28, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. It's the kingdom of God that will not be shaken. It's the kingdom of God that will last. Nations rise and fall. They always have and they always will, but God's kingdom will not be shaken. I mean, I thought, I think probably those living underneath each one of these kings and their reigns thought that they would never end. King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian dynasty he created, he was an absolute monarch and he had a vast rule over the whole Middle, Middle East. 
I'm sure people thought that would last forever. But King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom has fallen. But King Jesus' kingdom will not be shaken. Alexander the Great, a few years later, conquered the known world in but three years. He stretched all the way from Macedonia to the Indus River. It was unbelievable. People probably thought this kingdom will never end. Alexander the Great's kingdom has fallen. But King Jesus' kingdom has, cannot be shaken. Augustus Caesar, he was the first Caesar, and he started the Roman Empire, and that whole Roman rule lasted for a better part of a millennia. People that were part of Rome probably thought that Rome is eternal. It will never end. Caesar Augustus' kingdom has fallen, but King Jesus' reign cannot be shaken. Attila the Hun sacked Rome and brought down the greatest empire that ever existed, and lorded over all the barbarian ho- hordes of Germania. People thought he was un- couldn't be defeated. His reign has fallen, but the kingdom of Christ cannot be shaken. Genghis Khan, the Mongolian Empire, he filled up 12, uh, 12 million square miles. It probably seemed unbeatable. It would never end. His reign has fallen, but the kingdom of Christ cannot be shaken. Ivan the Terrible is the first czar of all Russia. You don't get a nickname like the Terrible for no reason. But his reign has fallen. But the kingdom of Christ cannot be shaken. Napoleon Bonaparte, he seemed unbeatable. Military mastermind, conquered most of Europe. Thought he was going to go on and on and on. His kingdom has fallen. But the kingdom of Christ cannot be shaken. Adolf Hitler, the Third Reich, the Blitzkrieg, looked for a while like he was going to conquer the whole world. People were terrified. But his kingdom has fallen. But the kingdom of Christ cannot be shaken. The United States, though not a kingdom, has been around for near 250 years. It's been a source of a lot of good, freedom that's been spread around the world, including in our own country, and I hope it lasts for many more years. But if the Lord tarries, Inevitably, like every other kingdom, it will fall. But the kingdom of Christ cannot be shaken. That's the kingdom we're building. That's the king we worship. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us to build the right kingdom. Father, so often it seems as though your kingdom is being shaken because we're not seeing with the eyes of faith. We're not looking in the right direction. Oh, I pray, God, that you would help First Baptist Church. You would help our people to have their hope grounded in the right place, that we would find great faith and trust in King Jesus and his rule. We'd find comfort there because it's a beloved reign. It's a beloved rule for those who've trusted in Christ. And I pray, God, that you would help us, Father, be about the business of building the kingdom of Christ that will never be shaken. Help us to find great joy in that and fulfillment and not be deterred by lesser ends when there's a greater work to be completed. I thank you, Father, for this reminder from your word, this instruction and this exaltation of King Jesus this evening. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.